which was considered the most serious of them, of all the other nine, was the fact when Almighty God told him to take his son to Isaac and bring him for a sacrifice upon the altar at Mount Maria. We find that the terminology there that the Torah speaks of, it says that Almighty God says to Avraham, Kachno es binicho. He says, I beg of you, take your, your son. Es yechidcha, you were, you were an only child. Asher ahafta, whom you love. And v'haleu la'olem, bring him up for a sacrifice. And then we find the story continues, how Avraham Avinu takes his... Uh, attendance with him and he takes the wood and the fire and the knife and everything else that goes along with it and goes for three days finally he recognizes the mountain upon which he felt that almighty God wanted him to bring his son upon that mountain because there was a cloud tied, tied upon it and so on and so forth but that's not the important thing the important thing that I want to stress here is I ask the question why is it that almighty God says to Abraham take your son why did he have to take his son himself? After all, Avraham Avinu was a very wealthy man. The fact that he tells him to go to, uh, to bring his son for a sacrifice, to slaughter his son, which means right in front of his eyes, I know that's going to put an end because after that there won't be anybody left and there won't be any generation to follow. Nevertheless, he says to him, Kach, do you yourself have to take your son? After all, God, okay, you're testing me, but why do you have to be so heartless? Why do you have to make me do it myself? If it's be, it'll be nice enough if I'll give you my son for a sacrifice. But why force me to be the one to go and, 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 and perform that act? Why make it so much more sorrowful than it is? Why do you make it hurt me more than it has to hurt me? It'll be bad enough if I'll find out that the thing, the job was done just as you wanted me to do it and finish. Goodbye and good luck. You asked me for my son. I gave you back my son. For if, you, if, if, if I didn't want to give it, you could have taken him anyway. So why does God say to him, Kachna has been Almighty God is a merciful father. And we know, We always pray to God, just as a father has mercy over his children, so you should have mercy over us. And we know that Almighty God is Ovinu of Arachman. He is a very, very dear and merciful father. If that's the case, why did he say, Kachna has been take your son? He could, sort of, he could have sent him with a butler. He could have sent him with one of his servants. He could have done it through someone else, but he didn't have to do it himself. But Almighty God had a, a kavone. He had a specific thought. And there was a reason why he told uh, Avraham Avinu to do this himself. Because he felt that this act that Avraham Avinu was performing, this was an act for all the future generations. By the virtue of what Avraham Avinu is going to be doing, this message will be sent out to all generations to come. The message of Mesir Nefesh, the message of self-sacrifice, the message of Kiddush Hashem, the message of sanctifying the Almighty God's name. And he wanted to set the example in such a way to say, to tell us that if you want, that the future generations should follow and do exactly as I have just commanded, Kachno, you have to do it yourself. You are the Father. You have to show the rest of the world that you are prepared to take your own child because Almighty God so commanded it not to try to use some kind of a substitute by some kind of act of proxy to send someone else to, to slaughter your son. But you yourself went, and you yourself went and did it, and you yourself were, had to stand and look and see how your own child is being burned for an offering before Almighty God. If you will take your son, then the rest of the generations will say, if Avraham Avinu was able to have Mesir Nefesh when he took his son upon the Akedah, then we should have Mesir Nefesh when we have to bring up our children. And we have to have Mesir Nefesh when we have to set the pace for our youth to be able to know how to live and to have their set of values and to know what is important and what is less important. And so therefore Almighty God felt that no other way could this be accomplished. But the Father himself has to do it. And when the father will do it himself, then all the future fathers will do the same thing. And when the child does it, then all the future gen children and the future generations will do it. But if he was going to work this out like sort of a, a piece of a Hollywood uh, act where they're going to put the, uh, 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 together some kind of a piece of theater where, uh, where they send an actor to do the job, this would never, never have been able to be, to be fulfilled the way Almighty God wanted it to be fulfilled. And so this is the uh, first basis for Chinuch. Kachna is You have to set the example for your child. 
Don't send your kid to uh, the yeshiva or to the school or to the shul and you go ahead and do something which is not right. Don't send the kid to Davin Shabbos in the morning and you go out on your boat or you go shopping or you go to wash the car. If you want your kid to Davin, Kachner's Benecha, take him. If you want your kid to Lake Tfilin, Kachner's Benecha, show him that you Lake Tfilin. If you want your t- kid to Davin, show him that you're Davining. If you want your kid to know what it means to eat kosher, show him that you won't go into a tray for restaurant and that you only eat kosher. And so on and so forth, right down the list. Setting the example for the child, this is setting the pace for the child. And this is the way you create an atmosphere. And this is the way you get a child in a certain mood. And you get him into a certain uh, uh, setting of the mind where he, he, he begins to think in a certain way. And he looks forward to doing certain things in a certain manner. The way he saw it by his parents. If it's by the process of osmosis, or if it's in, 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 in some kind of indirect manner, subconscious manner, then automatically this will seep into him. And ultimately it will begin to come out. And ultimately it will begin to show in the child's actions and the way the child conducts himself and the way the child does say certain things, emulating his father and mother, emulating his parents because he saw it. While it wasn't something that was knocked into him with a nail and a hammer, but nevertheless he saw it. And every time he saw it, it made an impression on his little brain. And when those little impressions begin to work, and when the, the moment comes, he begins, it begins to generate. And he begins to do the same thing that his father did. And, and, and shuckle like his father shuckled. And eat the way his father ate. And make the bracha the way his father makes a bracha. And wash his hands the way his father washes his hands. And so on and so forth. Children like to be copycats. They like to mimic. They like to do what others do. So if they see the right thing, they're going to have the right kind of chinuch. If they see the wrong thing, they're going to be brought up in that spirit. And that's what in number, in number one, that we have to have a mind. That's number one that we have to remember at all times. That don't expect that the teacher in the shul or in the school or the rabbi is going to do the job for you. And expect that when the kid comes home and sees the exact opposite of what his rabbi just just taught him, that the rabbi's influence is going to be more powerful than the father and mother's influence. It's not going to work that way. You must understand, to his father and mother, they they have that tie and that connection and that uh, emotional uh, bound upness which which they don't have with their rabbi. And automatically, if they see these things happen, and uh, when it's the, the exact opposite to what they've heard in the classroom or what they heard the rabbi say to them, then it causes some kind of a paradox in their heads and some kind of a revolution starts going on over there. They begin to shake. They don't know which is right and which is wrong. And they don't know whom to follow. And should they do it this way? Should they do it that way? And in their little subconscious little heads over there, the little brains, this begins to work. And they get all mixed up, the poor little kids. And then you find that you have all kinds of problems because the kid really doesn't know which way which way to go. And ultimately, he's going to collapse. Ultimately, he's going to capitulate. Ultimately, he's going to give in. Unless he has the strength and the backing that he gets from his parents when he comes home or before he left home to know that he comes from that kind of a city, from that kind of a house. Now, another very important thing is an upbringing of children. In the upbringing of children, there is such a thing called as discipline. Meshmas, the Hebrew word for that. Children have to be disciplined. Children have to know that a father or mother are parents and not pals. Children have to know that their parents are the ones to direct them and to tell them right from wrong. And that their parents are the ones to guide them. And their parents are the ones to tell them either they can do a certain thing or go to a certain place or not. And if their parents says it, they have to listen. It's not a question that the kid will come home and go into a tantrum and kick with his feet or scream his head off or start hollering or running around and the mother will get, they'll get all upset and the father will get all fed up and say, all right, go ahead and do it. Let me alone. Ray. Stop you howling and let me alone. I got no patience to listen to this all day and so on and so forth. It doesn't work that way. A kid has to know that when you say no, it's no. You know what it means? No it means no. It doesn't mean yes. Or it doesn't mean that I could trick you in turning your no into your yes because I can make you sugar and I can get you so crazy and so nervous and so upset that you're going to have to say yes. 
That's what the kids are. They're very smart. These kids are geniuses. They're dumb when they grow up. But when they're smart, they're brilliant. You know? And they, and they twiddle their, their parents around the little pinkies. The parents are dumb enough not to understand what the kid is doing. He, 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 with the kid, you know. He lays with him on the rug and he plays with him over there with the, with the kitty car, whatever it is over there. But this little guy, in his head, he knows exactly what he's doing. And he's maneuvering him around Boy Azoid. He's a side. And he gets whatever he wants. He gets everything accomplished. And if he, all he has to hear is a no, boy, did he let him have it. He lets him have it, but good. So the first thing that you have to remember is that uh, there has to be discipline. I don't say a guy should walk around with a bat smashing heads of his kids if they don't do something right away. But by the same token, I also don't say that he has to be a yes man to everything that the kid wants or the, or the kid requests. I don't care if it's a big thing or a small thing. He has to know that this is his father and this is his mother. And he has to know that before he's allowed to do something or he could do something, he has to ask permission. And if they tell him that he can't do it or he can't go a certain place, he shouldn't say, Yeah, man, you're always so mean. You don't live there, blah, 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 blah. Let's all say you mean, mean. Don't worry about it. He'll, he'll get over it. Don't you worry. He won't die from it, Khalila. No one ever did yet. So you got to understand. But, and all these little uh, tricks that the kids use are the things that you shouldn't fall for. One of the big serious problems in America, as far as I know is, and in the world today is, that there are no images of parents. Parents right away become pals. And the kid talks to him on the palsy wowsy level. He doesn't look up to him as a parent. He looks to him as his equal. He's only a bigger guy. He grew bigger than him. So he's going to grow up also to be big. So what's the big spiel over there? But as far as the, is it being able to say right or wrong, he could say just as the other guy, because he's my pal. So my pal says, oh, I don't have to listen to my pal. I, I do what I want. I, I also have a, 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 a say in the matter. It's not only what, 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 the, what the pal says. So parents have abdicated their positions as parents. And because of that, by virtue of the fact that the whole disciplinary system in the house has fallen down, then you find that you have a problem with children. When they grow up, they grow up like wild oats. And that's why I'm one of those fellows who maintains that you should give a smack to your kid every once in a while. And if he gets out of line, he should get a good patch. And a kind of a patch that he's going to feel, you know? Not a little love tap. <laughs> But you give him a zetz, it goes right from the seat to the head. It's a very miraculous kind of a system. You don't even need a battery for that, you know? One whack in his, you know what, and it travels right to the brain, and you get immediate action. All the psychiatrists in the world could never accomplish that with their talking. They could talk from today to doomsday. It'll never get through because it remains down there. We want it to get up here. One good frask, you know what that means? A frask is a... <coughs> that's what you get, you see? Sammy Levinson was a humorist, and he always used to tell that in his house there was a lot of kids. And of course, as you know, a lot of kids, so they got their father crazy. In his days, he says, we didn't have any, any psychiatrists. So they asked him, how is it? He didn't have psychiatrists with so many kids around in the house, and everybody running around doing something else. Ha <laughs> ha! He said, my father was the greatest psychiatrist. One whack! And he cured us right away. He says, we didn't need any more treatments. Like we understood right away. We got the message in two minutes. And this is what it's all about. Children have to be disciplined. And if you have to hit them, you hit them. In the olden days, they used to have a luxion strap. Do you know what means a luxion strap? Luxion means, in Yiddish, means noodles. So what they used to do, I remember it in my house, and this goes back over like 60 years or more, 65. In my house, my mother used to have a luxion strap hanging. Now, a luxion strap was made, was you took a little piece of bark of a tree, you know. They used to buy these in the hardware stores. And they used to take leather and cut the leather like, like strands of noodles, you know, that hung down. So you had like six or eight strands of noodles hanging down of leather, and that hung on the wall. And if somebody got out of line, mom took off the strap. Just picture this. And you get one whip with those six things, boy, you had a, ooh, baby. That was really hot stuff. You understand? Those noodles really went pretty far. You understand? So that used to be a luxury strap. But why was the idea to have a luxury strap? So they said to the kid, now listen here, hey, you see that? You want that to come off the wall? As soon as he took one look at that, forget it. You know, it's the old story of the kid that the, a wild kid. And they put him into the yeshiva, 
and this kid wasn't learning, he was getting his rabbit crazy. So he took him out from one yeshiva, they put him into another yeshiva. Doesn't work. The teacher says, please take him out. The principal says, we can't stand it. He's ruining the class. He's killing the rabbi. The rabbi wants to quit. He put him into a third yeshiva. It didn't work. Sent him away to a school. Finally, they decided they're going to send him to a Catholic parochial school. After the first week, the guy comes home. He's a real gentleman. So his father sat down and he says, listen, Jake, what is this? I had you one school, two schools, three schools, four schools. How come over there you never behaved? And here I put you in for one week. He said, you're already behaving? <laughs> he says, Dad, you don't understand. I took a look the way they nailed that guy on the cross. I knew here they mean real business. <laughs> when a kid sees that you mean real business, he perks up and he wakes up and he comes across. But if he knows he can get away with it because he can bamboozle his parents... Then you're going to have work for the psychiatrist, you understand? Because this kid is going to grow up like a misfit. Because at the age of four, he's already bossing everybody around. And by the age of 14, he thinks he's president of the United States. So how could you ever talk to a kid like that? So you're always having problems with him. But therefore, if you remember that as a parent, you have to discipline your child, all these things fall away. Now, there's another important thing in Chinuch. You know, it's not what you teach. Book knowledge is one thing. You can have a lot of book knowledge. And you can be a real moron, an intelligent moron, a very well-read moron. Isn't that nice, that combination? What does that mean? You read a book, you go to class, you learn a lot of things, but basically you're a moron. And if you're a moron, basically you're going to be able to act like a very smart moron. A very good example are the, are the Germans. Now, you see, the Germans, when, when the, the Holocaust took place, they were the most brilliant people. They were geniuses in every field. What did they utilize their brains for and their intelligence? They were inhuman human beings, in the form of human beings. But in their thinking... And in their uh, uh, psychos, and in their entire way of operation, and in the way of functioning, in that brain was locked in that viciousness, that venom, that poison, that desire to, for blood, to, to ruin, to destroy, to kill, to murder, to, to massacre, and so on and so forth. So that came out with the knowledge of the book. He had a doctor title, he was a professor title, he had a lawyer title. It didn't mean a darn thing. When it came to the moment that they let him loose, you saw what he was. He was a moron. He was a wild beast that had a lot of book knowledge. So what? That's not what Chinuch is about. Chinuch is where these, every single particle of the individual, every single part of the person, from his head to his toe, is involved and is developed in a certain way. And if that is not given the proper kind of, 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 of nourishment, and if it's not nurtured properly, then you must understand that you're going to have your problems. And that's why you need the ingredients that surround the individual, that round out the individual, that make that person understand how you have to live, how you have to react, how you have to act, how you have to be as a human being. And one of those very important ingredients is called mishpacha, is called family. It's very, very important to be part of a family. The structure of father and mother and children. This is very important. Now, if this is not something that you cut out of a, of a comic strip or you cut out of a jigsaw puzzle. This is something that, when it's put together, and Almighty God, in His infinite wisdom, understood how to do this. He, he, first, there are two individuals. And then these two individuals get married. And then from those th these two individuals come children. And then the children uh, begin to live together with their parents. And they have the influences on, the, on, the, on these children. And it becomes, the, it all of a sudden becomes one big beautiful family all together. And in everything that they do, they do as a family. And they do it as a, a whole unit. It's not a single individuality that exists over there. But each and every one has his part that he plays in the family life. 
and the part of family. And this whole concept of family, the going out t- together, the coming together, when you go to shul together, when you come home together, when you eat together, when you, when you uh, celebrate together, when you go to a function together, it's always a certain sense of everybody being one part, all for one and one for all. There's no separateness over there. Nowadays, when a guy or a girl gets a little older, what is the first thing they do? They move out of the house, right? They take a private apartment. They start living alone. Instead of living as much as you can with your parents and imbibing as much as you can from them, learning before the, ne- the, the years come when you're going to have to leave the house because you're going to get married with God's help and you're going to have to build your own home. Instead of doing that, as soon as he becomes in his high teens, out he goes. Out she goes. And they, have to, and they begin living their own style of life, their own way of life. They are ill-prepared for that responsibility. They're not strongly yet enforced or reinforced to be able to go out to the world and do things on their own. Sure, they know how to wash dishes. That, they, that you don't have to be very smart. Any dummy can do that. They know how to go out and buy something at the salad bar. They can go out and always and get a sandwich. They can even prepare something, what they throw into a pot, like an egg or uh, some water for coffee, if they, if they don't burn the pot, and so on and so forth. But after all, they're, ready, they're, 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 they're brilliant, they're great, they're wonderful, aren't they? But that breaks up the whole concept of family. That feeling of togetherness that holds the person is, is solid and keeps him strong because he knows that there is someone there that he could rely upon, that he could lean upon, that he could depend upon. He's not himself. This crazy world of ours, where they get out and they move out on their own, and they have to make their own living, and they pay their own rent, and they have to start cooking for themselves, and they have to clean for themselves, and they have to work for... I mean, Shagas, what kind of life is this? What kind of Shabbos is it? What kind of Yontif is it? It's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. The only thing is... Later on, maybe, they hope to get married and so on and so forth. But they're the ones that get married always the last. Because living this kind of a life, it's not going to bring them very close to a partner in life. Not at least for a serious matter, it won't. And uh, it certainly wouldn't bring them together to be able to begin leading a life that will be the kind of a life that you'll be happy with and be proud of. So here comes another concept. This is chinuch. This is what you call education. This is what you call bringing up children in a normal uh, surrounding, in a normal milieu where children see certain things in the house that they could appreciate. And here comes another responsible thing. The respect of a father to a mother and a mother to a father, a husband to a wife, a wife to a husband. When children observe that parents don't get along amongst themselves, either they shout at each other, or they disagree with each other, or they are disrespectful to each other, or they, or they, they do certain things to hurt each other, or they act in such a way as enemies to each other. This has a definite, definite impression upon the children. And psychologists and psychiatrists will tell you today that this even has an impact on the kid in the cradle, is, is in the child's infancy. Now, you see, the child, in whatever stage that child is, we don't understand how that little brain functions. But one thing is sure, the child sees, the child hears, the child has emotions, the child has feelings. And later on, these things come out in life. And if you see sometimes a kid of 20 goes a little wacky, and they take him to the psychiatrist, and he puts him down on the couch, or uh, he uh, begins to work on him, and what happens? He tries to put him to sleep, and he should talk. He should talk about what happened when he was young. Why does he have to know that? What's your business when I was young? Did my mother diaper me? My mother didn't diaper me. What's your geschäft? What is it? I'm 20 years old today. It's not your business. What does it got to do with the fact that I'm a little whacked up now? What does it got to do with that? But the answer is that it's not just the way it sounds. That when the psychiatrist listens, And he detects that there was something in the life of that child's family that caused this child to be upset. But the child couldn't speak out because he was too young. He didn't know how to speak. He couldn't speak. 
The only thing he could have done was cry. If he cried, he got a spanking. So he had to shut up. So he had to keep quiet. So he had to sort of keep it in himself all the time. Twin, at the age of 20, he starts coming out. All that bitterness that he had in his heart. And all that disappointment that he was observing and watching in the house. And all those different uh, uh, situations that took place in the atmosphere in, 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 in of the house. And these are the things that had an impression upon him. So uh, parents have to be extremely careful. The way they act, if you want to have a good fight with your husband or with your wife, either go into your bedroom, lock the door when the kids are asleep, fight your heads off, kill each other, not my business. But not in front of the kids. In front of the kids, it has to be kuchkala muchkala. You got to love each other and kiss each other and, the whole, and be nice to each other, be kind to each other, respectful to each other, and take out the garbage and wash the dishes and do whatever mom wants and you're so wonderful and go shopping and do whatever you want. And the kid sees, oh, such a gorgeous, gorgeous relationship. How they get along and how look how wonderful this is. And this has such a, makes such a lasting impression upon them. And I know this from many, many times when people come to me and ask me about a shidduch. And they ask me, I met this girl, and uh, well, there's, there's something strange about this girl. Well, what's strange about her? Well, I think she's a little mean. Oh, a little mean. Is that right? How do you detect that she's a little mean? Well, I said something or I did something. Boy, did she sound off. Oh, I said, you better watch your bones, kiddo. You better watch out. The, if that lady has a mean streak in her now, before you even got married to her, when you get married with her, you're going to have a snake in a house, and she's going to finish you off real quick, buddy. So you better watch out before you go out with this girl again to be sure that this is exactly what you're looking for. So where, did the, where does all this come from? Where does this come from? These are the things that you automatically seep in, like a sponge swallows them up, and you take all these things into yourself. And then comes the time when they begin to sprout out. Sometimes they blossom out in a big way, and they're real nuts. That's where you find them real crazy. But sometimes, you know, they, they cover up on, on some of these things, and you can't tell. But there are other times when you see a child coming from a fine family, where there was a beautiful relationship of the, of the husband and the wife with the children and the children with their parents. And you see there's a, there's a certain silkiness about the person. There's a certain refinement about that individual. There's a certain delicateness in, 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 in the lady or in the man. And you see that there's something out of the ordinary. It's not just a rough piece of sackcloth, but this is something really, something very, very decent and, and wonderful and beautiful. Then you decide that maybe this is the kind of a, a person you want for a mate in your life. But this chinuch is gotten only when you live in that kind of an atmosphere. It's not the kind of a stuff that you can do like you take you go into a doctor and get a B12 shot and he gives you a shot and all of a sudden you get strong and you, your heart's going around. It doesn't go like that, you see. This, to have all these emotional feelings and to have the, all this approach to life and to your, to your fellow human being and to uh, your responsibilities, these are things that come very, very automatically, subconsciously. But if it's there, it's going to have an impression on you and an impact upon you. And if it's not there, then forget about it. It's going to be a tough, tough road ahead for you because these are some of the things that are coming to hound you and these are some of the things that are going to destroy you ultimately. My mother of blessed memory always used to say, if parents want to have children, they have to see to take care of their children and to bring them up properly. And if they're not prepared to do that, they shouldn't have children in the first place. You just can't have children and throw them to the winds. It doesn't go like this. Children are a very precious commodity. And if you want to know how precious that commodity is, you take a look at people who are married and don't have children. How their heart goes out for a child. And what they would do to have a child. Only today someone called me from Worcester and was telling, was begging me, maybe, maybe you know of a child that, that, that these people could adopt. Because their heart goes out and, and they feel that there's no fulfillment in their whole life. They have, thank God, everything. They have money and a nice car and a nice home. And, and they get along beautifully and everything else. But the, 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 the optimum is missing. That beautiful, that beautiful icing on the cake that makes life so gorgeous and gives life a, a, a purpose in living. And you feel that there's the kind of a joy that's brought into your life that you don't have just from being with each other. But this is something that has, is an extra added dividend. And if you don't understand that, and if you don't have that, that feeling, then it's a terrible, terrible thing. And uh, these kids who uh, don't have the, the, the privilege 
are being brought up in these kind of homes. These kids never suffer the consequences later. And that's why you have a, such a crazy mixed up world. And if I want to be a little more rough, I would say maybe that's one of the reasons why so many kids go on to drugs nowadays. Because there's nothing to hold them grounded. They must go on a flight, you see. They must get spaced out because they can't accept what they have. They can't accept what they see in their own immediate surroundings. Sometimes they see hypocrisy by parents. They can't live with it. And they don't know how to, how to cope with it. So what do they do? They go out and they try to go on a trip. What do you mean on a trip? A trip away from reality so that they don't have these feelings. And they don't, under, they don't it, it doesn't protect, it doesn't pertain to them, you see. So he feels that this is the way to get out of it all, not knowing that this is the most destructive way that he could have taken. There are so many other different ways. If he w only would have come and asked the proper people and looked for the proper guidance, they could have led him in the right path where he could have uh, fulfilled his life, even if he didn't have it where he was. So you take a look and see what goes on in, in, in the world today, and you realize that chinuch, the word education, is not something that comes through the uh, 110 Livingston Street, the educational system of, of, of a city, or that comes through through a parochial educational system. Even that doesn't complete the whole job yet. It's more than a lot of that. It has to do, as we said before, first with parents. Then we go into discipline. Then we go to uh, the mutual respect for one for another. Then you have the family togetherness. Then comes another very interesting thing, which I have a lot of feeling for and belief in. And that is ceremonials. Ceremonials have a lot to do with kids. As children, we love to see certain things in, in life that come in life that give us a certain high. Now, I could go into this from many different uh, areas. We'll take, for instance, Pesach. Pesach is a very interesting holiday. A holiday when you have to change your dishes, you have to see to it the house has to be clean, and you have to change everything over, and you have to make sure that the tablecloths and the tables and then everything is, and the pots and the pans and the silverware and the whole business, and you have to make covers on the sink, and you have to make covers on the, uh, 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 on the uh, stove, and you have to cash the stove, and you're busy burning and cleaning and rubbing and fixing, and everybody is busy, and everybody is busy shopping, and you have to buy this, you have to buy that. You know, in America today, they've taken that away. You know why? You go to a hotel. You go to a hotel. You leave Erev Yontif about 12 o'clock, or if you're going to a further distance, you go a day before, the house remains the same. A kid never gets the pleasure of being able to watch this work, how you prepare a house for Yontif, how you bake matzahs, the different delicacies that you have to eat, the way you have to prepare for the Seder, the grating of the horseradish. I mean, all these little things, when you're little kids, they're very intriguing, and they're very exciting. And then sitting by the table and having the, the, the Seder, and everything goes along with it. It's, it's, it's tremendous. It's tremendous. All these little ceremonials. And, and this goes on Shabbos, and this goes on every Yontif, on the big holidays and the smaller holidays, but ceremonials are very, very important. And you can't just use some kind of a substitute for it. Going to a hotel and eating matzah doesn't give you the full flavor of a Pesach. That's not the way you want your ch child to grow up and see what Pesach is like and what a Seder is like and what Yontav is like and everything else that goes along with it, with it is like. And the same thing will go for a sukkah, for instance. A sukkah... I mean, you know what it is till you put that sukkah together and you schlep the schach and you have to put the lights up and you have to see to it to nail it together and you have to do this and you have to run and you have to get a table and you get to get that thumbtacks and, and everybody's busy, everybody's running and everything and the kids have to sweep out and you got to put the table cloth out and you got to get the yes rig and the lulav and the whole works. What do you do in America if you're a real religious? You pick yourself up and go to the country and you go to the hotel. Guy has a sukkah there where you walk in. Hey, hey, it's a nice sukkah and you sit down and eat. Goodbye and good luck. It's the same thing that was. Nobody has the feeling of building a sukkah. No one has the feeling of being able to put together that beautiful yontif 
where you spend seven, eight days outside, and it's such an intriguing kind of a concept. You're sitting out in the street, and you're eating, and you're singing, and you're making kiddish, and, and, and uh, uh, you have special delicacies. Oh, oh how, how beautiful this is. How wonderful it is. But this is all good and well if you have it. But if you, go, if you don't have the ceremonials, forget about it. Now just understand, compound this by a kid who doesn't have the hotel either. Who doesn't have the yunt of all together. Who doesn't know what a Pesach is all about. Who doesn't know what it means to prepare eating the last meal before Yom Kippur, before you have to fast, start your fast for 26 hours. Or the kid who has to come to shul and, and see the rabbi or, or the one who's blowing the shofar in his kittle, standing up there with that shofar in a moment of awe when the whole, when the walls are trembling and, and everybody is in such a state of mind praying to Almighty God for the new year. He doesn't see it. He doesn't know what it is. He's, you know where he is? He's on a college campus somewhere. He's out the street. He doesn't know what the heck it's all about. Now, how do you expect this child or this young man or this young lady to have a feeling for Yiddishkeit? How do you expect them to want to have a sense of belonging? That's chinuch. That is what you call chinuch. And that's the way you have to see to it, to utilize every moment. You know, I got to tell this story about myself. We were six brothers. We're never only five now. We're six brothers, and we weren't rich people. But Pop was a very, he was an American boy, but he was a very, very decent fellow. He was my father. And, of course, everybody speaks well of his father. But Pop was a great guy. And he made it his business, you hear, that for every holiday, he bought the kids something. So I, I remember there was a fellow on Avenue S. This I'll never forget. Avenue S. He had a, he had, the man had a store that he used to sell shoes. My father was in the wholesale dry goods business. And he used to sell these people. You know, they had these uh, stores that sold shoes and dresses and uh, kiddie stuff and lady stuff and so on. Pop was a salesman. And that's where he used to travel. So he used to have people he used to uh, be very friendly with. So Pop used to sit, bring in the six sons and line them up on the shoes uh, rack or by the shoe rack. You know, he sat us all down. He said, Sam, Sam, the guy's name was Sam, Sam. I'll never forget that. He said, Sam, put the kids on shoes. Okay. So every we knew that Yontif, every one of us had shoes. The next Yontif, he bought us a suit. You know, we were six boys, no, no girls in the house. But one year, this I didn't remember. But one of the gentlemen who met me many years later told me a story. He says, one year, all you boys walked in with sneakers. He says, you walked in Rosh Hashanah with sneakers. So they couldn't figure it out. What is it? Sam Hecht went nuts? What, what, what do you buy the kids sneakers for? It's Yontif. Who wears sneakers on Yontif? Anyways, later he found out that my father Nebuch didn't have enough money for shoes. But he wanted the kids not to lose the feeling that you have to get something special for Yontif. So he settled for buying us a pair of sneakers. So we walked in, so six pair of feet walked in with new sneakers on. But to us, we knew that it's Yontif, and we knew that Papa bought us something new. And this, you don't forget. You don't forget these things. And this remains embedded in your heart and your mind for the rest of your life. And then when you bring up children, and when you have to do with this, you, you feel the same way. You try to carry across that feeling of appreciation of the holiday. Do you know how that enriched the Yontif to us? Do you know what that meant to us? When we put a little shirt down on the bed and a tie that we were going to put on special for Yontif. When we, got, we had our bath and we got all dressed up for Yontif. And it was something special and all of us were, uh, thought he was the best dressed kid on the block, you know. Although we maybe weren't. But, but nevertheless, we thought we were. But it was something at least we felt proud. We felt very honored. It was Yontif. And we felt that the, we are the greatest because we are, we, are, we are now part of that holiday celebration. And look, look the way we look. This is the way we are. So ceremonials are very, very important. And you can't poo-poo them. And you can't just let them go by and let somebody else do it. And uh, here we come to the next point. The next point is involvement. Children have to be involved in what's happening in the family. Children shouldn't be left out. Or as you would say, the loving dovey mothers of today, they want to spare their child. They want to spare the poor little kids. Entelech. He shouldn't wash the dishes. She shouldn't wash the dishes because they may get a little rough, you know, and you'll have to put on cold cream. And that's terrible. You know, that's all. That's not the way it works. Children have to be involved. And you want to know something? 
Children want to be involved. You want to know something better? Children love to be involved. Because being involved makes it part of their life. It's not something that's shoved on them. Okay, come on in, kids. Now you sit down. This kid didn't have any, he doesn't know what it's all about. Now you have to present something to him. But if he was busy all day, running around for mom to get this, or running around for dad to get this, and seeing to the house should be fixed up, and here they had to wash the floor, and here they had to clean, and here in those days we didn't have people coming in to clean. But we had to do everything ourselves, you understand. But, it, but we knew. We had our obligations, we had our responsibilities. But we felt very proud, because we were part of it. We helped make Shabbos, we helped make Yantif. We helped Mama when she stood and needed the dough to make the chalis. This was, this was so beautiful. Or we watched how mom made the noodles. You think you were, you know, today you want noodles. You go into the store, you buy a box of noodles. My mother never, 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 never bought noodles. Mama made noodles herself. You know how they made noodles? Let me teach you. This is a whole science. They, see, they used to take wa wa water and flour and eggs, and they used to mix it together and make a dough out of it. Then they rolled the dough as thin as tissue paper. I never knew how they were able to do that. It's thin as tissue paper, and they spread it out on, on tables, on sheets, on, you know, tablecloths, until they got dry. Then, uh, then they went and rolled them up, right? They rolled up these sheets. They were big sheets. They rolled up the sheets, and then Mom would take a knife. Listen how this works. And she put her hand down on this thing, and this is the way she chopped, chopped it. I never know how she didn't chop her fingers off. She went so darn quick with it, you know? And then she picked it up, put it together on her side, this was the noodles that we had Friday night in the soup. Okay? This is what it was. So you have to understand that when kids are involved, it gives them a certain feeling of richness, a certain feeling of belonging, a certain feeling of pride, that when Shabbos and Yontif comes, and Mama becomes the queen, and Dad becomes the king, after a week of hard work and labor, where they slaved away to keep everything going, to make ends meet, and to keep their heads above water. But things weren't in those days the way they are, thank God, today. A lot, a lot different. And believe me, boy, it was tough to keep six brats going. But nevertheless, God was, was good to Pop and Mom, and they, and they managed to, to keep us going. But we always had our responsibilities. And this is what is important for children. You cannot... By not making them do something, you think you're doing them a favor, right? By telling them, oh, you sit down, read a book, watch television, oh, go out and take a little fresh air, play a little ball. That's the worst thing you could do. When Friday afternoon comes, you should say to, to your daughter or your son or your granddaughter or your grandson, listen, that you know I'm still missing some tomatoes in the house. Run to the store and fetch some tomatoes or get some nash or do this or do that or hang up the, uh, the window shades or hang up the curtains or wash the floor or take out the garbage. I don't know what to tell them. But they should be busy with the hachon and the Shabbos, the hachon and the yontif. And when you have the ceremonials, and then when, when Yontif comes or Shabbos comes and they get dressed in their Shabbos clothes and they go to the synagogue together and uh, they pray together and come home and make Kiddush together, and eat their meal together and sing their mirrors together. This is Gan Eden This would be the real Garden of Eden on this world because there is no more beautiful feeling and there's no greater high that anyone could get into than to have this kind of a situation. So here comes another very important factor in, uh, the, in, in the matter of education. We have something else. I believe that kids have to have something to take their time up. Now, let me tell you what that means. When we were little kids, we had clubs, a club. And we had a president and a vice president, and we used to meet certain nights of the week to have meetings, and we'd play in certain things. We'd play in certain charitable things that we gave a half a dollar to, to, to some of Those days, we used to get a petty spending money. So how much could we have had put together? And uh, we all had our little jobs. In shul, we also had little jobs. I remember that I became, I must have been, oh, eight, nine years old. I became the gabai of Kenya's sperm. I was the one who collected money to buy the sperm. And you understand, people, when they see a little cute kid, so they right away respond to him. And he loves it. The kid likes it, you know. What I, I remember like today, I used to have a little book, and I used to take two cents a week, two pennies a week. And I had a whole system, a bookkeeping system, 
where I used to go to the, each guy in shul, and I used to go over, he used to give me two pennies, and I marked down the two pennies in his thing. Then I took the two pennies and put them into the pushkin. And I'll never forget the tragedy that befell me one day when I found that they stole the pushkin. There must have been three dollars there. But to me, this was the greatest loss of my life. They took away all my pennies that I had collected the whole week, and this was the, the terrible, terrible thing that could have happened. But it may be busy. You see, it may be busy with something very interesting. And it may be busy with something that gave me a purpose and a goal and a satisfaction. It gave me a purpose and gave me a feeling that I'm making a contribution, that I am part of this great big synagogue in which I was, I was davening, in which my father used to take me, and to which I, in which I was... Clubs, so we used to have outings where we went and we had ball teams. We were little kids. But we had all these things, and we had a, had a vote for president, we had a vote for vice president, and there was a whole geschäft. But it made us busy with very interesting things. And we were always looking, thinking of ideas. What could we do next, and how could we do this? And if we had a run in a campaign, so we got the other little kids to try to vote for you. And it was a whole business, similar to what you have today where the president of the United States runs for office. You understand? It was one of those kind of campaigns, except, of course, a little less. And there was, it, but it was something that was very, very catchy. It was very, very, very intriguing. And this is the way you keep kids occupied. One of the worst things that you could do in Chinuch is to give kids time to waste. If kids are not occupied, they are prone to do things they're not supposed to do. If you give children free time without giving them a designed program, then you must be prepared that they either will meet someone they shouldn't meet, or they'll do something they shouldn't do, or, God forbid, get into trouble, and uh, it'll be too late. The worst thing that a kid could have is free time. Another very important thing is you have to see to it to know where your child is at all times. That's chinuch. You can't just send your kid away and, and not know where the kid is. You have to know with whom that child is going. And if the kid says, I'm going to my friend, you really have to be sure that that kid is going to, to, her, to his or her friend. And, and if once, God forbid, you find out that they lie to you, then you should know you already have the first seed of trouble. Because if that's let alone, if you don't crush it at that point, you should be prepared that this will go from bad to worse to worse to worse to the end. You, and kids don't, they don't think they're doing something wrong, you see. They don't understand. They don't feel these things. But that's why we are the parents. That's why we are the chaperones. That's why we are the ones who have been commissioned by God to watch over these kids and to make sure that they grow properly. Just like a tree. He automates us so the man is like the tree of the field. And if you would see that a, a tree will be bending, you'll be there right away to straighten it out because that's part of a seeing it to it that you should have a straight tree growing right upright. And the same thing is if you see a kid that's bending, you must see to it quickly to give him the support that he needs to level him off, to straighten him out, that God forbid he shouldn't go off on a tangent, that he shouldn't go and do the things that he shouldn't be doing. You must remember that it's a very interesting thing that we find that the Tana tells us in others. In, in the ethics of our fathers. He tells us that uh, he from whom man is satisfied, then God is satisfied. Why doesn't he say it the other way around? He from whom God has pleasure. And man, man has pleasure. It doesn't work that way. Because you must understand, in upbringing of children, in educating children, the, the stress has to be on the conduct of the child. You have to see to it to bring up the child that is respectable, that gives honor to an elder, that takes a recognition of authority, that sees to it to, when he's told to do something, he does it. He does not think he can get away with it. Because if he begins, if he's brought up in that way, where he thinks he can get away with it, then you should know you have a serious case on your hands and you have going to, you're heading for real, real trouble. That's why you must make sure that when you bring up your child, you teach him to be respectable, to be honorable, and uh, to be able to be a gentleman and a gentle lady. It's interesting. Somebody told me this morning that he met a fellow, and uh, this fellow tells him that he just came from one of the out-of-town cities 
where he was studying during the year. And he says, don't you know who I am? He says, no, I don't know who you are. So the fellow says to this rabbi, he says, well, I, I went with your son together in that yeshiva in that town. Oh, so he says, uh, that's interesting. My son never told me about you. A little later on in the day, the rabbi meets his son. And he says to his son, you know, he says, I met one of your colleagues today, one of your friends. And he t- gave me regards from you. And he told me that you studied together. He says to me, tell me, this is a, a, a kid, one of our own children? So he, the kid says to his father, what do you mean, one of our own children? He says, well, the way this kid spoke, the way this kid acted, it was something very, very special. He says, well, then you should have known right away he's not a Lubavitcher. Okay? And that tells it all. Because you think, if you're a Lubavitcher Chosid, you can be a Chutzpanik. And if you're a Lubavitcher Chosid, you could push by the Rebbe and step on somebody's head, even if five, five times your age. And if you think that because you are part of the system, you could do whatever you want, and you could be disrespectful to anyone you want, to your father, to your mother, to your brother, to your uncle, to the rabbi, to the people, because after all, you're a chassid. You only listen to the Rebbe. And if you don't listen to the Rebbe, you don't have to listen to anyone else. And if you don't have to listen to anyone else, no one has the right to tell you anything what to do. And if no one has the right to tell you what to do, then it's a big nerve on the part of the one who says it, that he's saying it. So if he says it, i got to give him back. i got to let him know that he's not my boss, that he shouldn't be talking to me this way. And he shouldn't tell me what's right to what's wrong, because i got a Rebbe. If my Rebbe tells me what to do, and that's all, then I'm not going to take it from you. I'm not going to take it from anyone else. So you have to understand, Chinuch means developing the entire being. It's not just the book knowledge. Uh uh-uh. uh. That's only part of it. You could be a total illiterate. Do you hear? A total illiterate. But you could be a mensch. You could be a, a, a person with whom it's a pleasure to talk, a person who acts properly, a person who, 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 who walks and deals and, and, and eats and drinks properly, who has the proper manners, who is decent, who is honest, who is upright, who is respectable, who is refined, who is great doesn't mean anything. Of course, it's important to mold the two together. It's wonderful when you take that knowledge that you uh, imbibe, especially the knowledge of Torah, and you take that, and that saturates your body, and saturates your mind, and you take the learning of Torah, the, those beautiful ideals that Torah gives you in the philosophies of Torah, and you take those beautiful concepts and uh, those beautiful standards that Torah sets for you and the values that Torah sets for you, for you and the priorities that Torah sets for you, and you put that together with gentleness, it becomes a whole different world. It's so interesting. I'm, I travel the world. And when I come into various countries and I meet with children and I meet with people, it is remarkable to notice the difference in how these people act. It's such a pleasure to see how able, that's the only word I have, so decent, so refined, so beautiful, the way they talk to you, the, the way they act to you, the way they, they, uh, they honor your presence. If they mean it or not, they'll never know. It, it seems to me they're always very, very sincere. And in one of those places, I'm sorry I have to give you the boost, but I want to give it here, is South Africa. It's one of those most beautiful countries in the world. And, and to see how the kids are so respectable, so beautiful, so elegant. It's, it's something which is out of the ordinary. You don't find it. And, and the way they're, they're together this with their families, the relationship, and with, their, with, their, with the other children. It's such a beautiful world out there. And I always say to myself, why can't we have something like this in New York? The answer is that the whole standard of Chinuch is different. In the yeshivas, it's different. They stress different points. They don't stress these kinds of situations that has to do between man and man, which is very, very important. Because when a man gets married or a woman gets married and they go out into the world, their Torah knowledge is a backup to what they're going to have to be doing. But the first thing they have to do is project their image before the other person. And if they haven't been brought up properly, and if they don't know how to act, and if they don't know how to present themselves, they're going to be a total failure. They're not going to be accepted by society. People will reject them. People will frown from them. People will not want to be near them because this is not the kind of company that people like to, to, to stay with unless they're just like them and not better than they, maybe worse. So here comes another very important situation that we have to remember. This is already the responsibility of the rabbis in the, and the teachers to see to it, to stress those points in life that will make 
the individual, a kind of, 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 of a complete unit that will be a pleasure from every angle and from every sense of the word. Just one more thought, and I'm going to close. You know, it's interesting to find, to, to look into Torah. In the beginning, there were two brothers. There was a Cain and an Abel. And I don't have to tell you how many people were around then. <laughs> it was a little generation. It was a little bit, little bit heap of people. But even so, two brothers couldn't get along. And what happened? By Yochum Cain al Hevel, by Yahagayu. Cain gets up on his brother Hevel and kills him. Okay? And we know what goes on over there where God speaks to him and the whole works that goes on after that. Then the Torah tells us the following. Cain lived on and uh, he had another child with his wife and the child's name was Hanoch. So Cain went and built a city and he went and built the city and he named the city just as he named his son Hanoch. In other words, it was called the city of Hanoch. That was the name of the city. Like we have Washington, this was the city of Hanoch. Come on, great commentaries, and they ask the question, why was this so significant for Torah to tell us? First of all, why, who cares what he called the name of the city? Second of all, why did he build a city? Third of all, why did he talk about the, the, the city of Hanoch? He could have given it some other name. Why do you have to give the name of the name of Hanoch? And evidently, if Torah finds it important enough to record this in Chumash, in Torah, then there must be a very, very serious reason for it. And there must be a purpose. There must be a message that Torah is sending out to the world. What is that message? But my dear friends, it seems to me that Torah wanted to tell us the following. Cain realized after he killed his brother, that the reason why he was able to do this and uh, the basis for him going out and killing his brother was because he lacked the proper education. He didn't have the right chinuch. For if he would have been brought up in a proper way, he couldn't have killed his brother. It's only when you're brought up like a wild man that if you don't like something that someone else does, you go out and kill them, like we see nowadays, as it's happening all the time. Torah comes to tell us, He had a child and he called him Hanoch to tell us, listen, remember, when you have a child, the first thing you should bear in mind is Hanoch. You have to give that kid education. And the education is not, as I said, just the book knowledge, learning to come at Salafor. But it takes in every part and every particle that we spoke about, plus many others which we didn't even mention here tonight. But that was only for himself and his own family. But he wanted the world to know. So by he bone ear, he felt just putting up a building and calling it the house of Hanoch wasn't enough. He built an entire city. Why did he build that city? So when a city is on the map, a city is known to people all over the world. People travel all over the world to come to a certain city. And he called that city, which became a city known throughout the world as the name of his son, Hanoch, to tell the world that you have to remember, if you have a child, give him the proper upbringing. And if you don't give him the proper upbringing, remember one thing. He may have the same fate that I had. He may kill his brother just as I killed him. And the only way you're going to tame him the only way you're going to teach him, the only way you're going to control him, the only way you're going to see to it that this young man or young woman is, lives the proper kind of a life and does things that are right is only by giving them the proper, proper education. They should know and feel and understand what they have to know and what they have to uphold, what's important and what's less important as it goes on in life itself. And so, my dear friends, for a little bit of a an hour and three minutes. We went through a couple of things here tonight which I hope and uh, uh, feel will be beneficial to somebody out there in the world. I don't know to whom, but if it does any good, I'll be very, very happy. It's meant to be good because I believe that these are some of the a aches and ills that we're suffering from. and These are some of the pains 
that have engulfed our, our, our lifestyles today and have caused such an uproar in the world. And that's why, why we see a world going downhill in the full sense of the world with all the great accomplishments that we think we see. But it's not really, really the way it sounds. And it's, it's a very sick, sick world out there. And unless we straighten ourselves out, and unless we get the message across, AIDS will, become, will be more rampant, and drugs will be more rampant, and murders will be more rampant, and rapes will be more rampant, and killing of fathers of children and children of parents will be the same thing. There will not come no end. It can only get worse and not get better. Because in my opinion... With all due respect to all those brilliant men and women sitting up there in the high ivory tow towers, they are not attacking the cause, you see. They are just at attacking the periphery, the, the, the thing that's on top. But that's not, what's, that's not the way you cure a sickness. If someone has a cancer and uh, you give him something to deaden the pain, that doesn't take the cancer away. The cancer is there. But... He doesn't feel it. Our job is to see to destroy the cause of the illness, to see to destroy that which is causing this generation of young kids to grow up to be the kind of children who at the age of 11 and 12 are already taking drugs and who become a serious menace to society and a threat to the world and, of course, to their own immediate families. So if we walk B'dach Hashem, if we go according to Torah, and if we uphold Torah and mitzvahs, and if we imbue this into our children, and uh, one very important thing is that constant surveillance of our own children, in a very indirect and a very nice way, just to know what's going on with them at all times, wherever they may be, no matter what age they are. Children are children, and you don't know what the rest of the world is apt to do to them or cause them to do, God forbid. So if we will uphold our responsibilities and not take this as just something fleeting by, just waiting for the bar mitzvah to come or the bas mitzvah to come so that we can show off, that we can make a nice, beautiful affair because we made a lot of money. That's not what it's all about. What it's all about is to see, to be able to bring up a child that we can be proud of and know that this child will be a source of nachas to the parents and to the world and uh, to see to it that uh, through these children, that the world will become purer and cleaner and better and more wholesome and that we can prepare this world to be the place where Mashiach will come speedily to take us out of Golis because the way things are going, unless he shows up real soon, boy, I don't know what's going to be. I, I'm running out of patience, I can tell you. I don't know how the Rebbe is holding out so long, but I can't. I'm not as patient as he is. And he keeps talking about Mashiach coming, but, I, you know, I'm from Kentucky and seeing his believing, and I keep on telling the boss I want to see him already. Well, how long do you keep promising me he's going to come? I want to see him, and then, then I'll know that everything has been all right. But until that point, all these things are great and wonderful, but come on. So let's hope to God that we'll have nachas from our growing children, and we'll see a generation that will be a Deir Yisharim Yevirach, and that we will have the ability and the wisdom to know how to deal with our children and how, what to do for them and so that they will know what to do for us and God will gather in our sons and our daughters and our youth and our elders and all together we will go out of Golis with Mashiach Amen Alrighty Good job Thank you Thank you Thank you Thank you The answer to that is that you can't give a blanket suggestion for all these kind of situations. First of all, it has to do with the cause. Why is the kid kutzpahdik? The second thing, how old is the child? The third thing, how could this child be disciplined? What ways? What does he like? What doesn't he like? What do we take away from him? Th these are things that have to be studied. You just, uh, you just, I can't tell you, go t take a bat and hit him because the patch didn't work. <laughs> I can't do that. But we have, you have to deal with, there are, I, I have to also make mention of one fact. There are children who are sometimes born with a deficiency, you see. That's another story altogether. This is sick. If God forbid a child is sick, then you have to deal with a problem from another standpoint altogether. Then, then, then there's an entirely different kind of a treatment over there. But this is a kid who, who needs certain help. 
In other words, he has to be subordinated in his chemistry, maybe. Maybe he's lacking a certain vitamin. Or maybe his nerve system is... is uh, that's why sometimes you find kids who are hypertension. You know, they're always jumping. They can't stay in one place. They're always sitting and walking. You know, if they get the teacher crazy, he get himself crazy. That much because he, it's, he has no control. You see, so that's something that has to be already taken care of from another. Then you you got you got to study the case. Do you understand? And you have to be able to d d diagnose it properly. And after it's diagnosed, you have to see the, the, the treatment. But you can't let the thing go. You see, we have a lot of parents who say, "Yes, that's a vil jingle, a vil jingle." You know, if he's a vil jingle, he's a wild child. That's one thing. But but if it's a, a vil jingle because there's something wrong, this you have to ascertain as quickly as possible so that you can nip it in the bud. Anybody else? Either I didn't say anything right or everybody, or everybody was asleep. <laughs> oh, you, you, you don't want me to talk about it right here in the open. <laughs> that you come to see me in my study. That's a serious problem. You know that? Because this, ha this makes waves in the world. It's not so simple. Was the, the between Kiddush Hashem and Chilul Hashem is a thin strand, and it means nothing. But the one who thinks he's really smart, Alaki, and, and, and wise, to turn the other guy off, that'll never want to come into a shul as long as he lives. So I mean, I, I realize these problems, and they're very, very serious, very serious. When, when does the thinner start? Yeah. When the child is one minute old. Yeah, I know, but Just as he's born. That's from, from that point on, you already start educating him. In what way? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Taking care of him, showing you love for him, being there when the ch child needs you, to train the kid. Little, little, every, every day the kid grows a little more and then develops a little more and so on and so forth but he has to know that he has a loving father there and a loving mother there and that they're doing for him what he needs and they're, he, he always why does he smile to a father and he doesn't smile to a stranger because he recognizes his father or his mother right so it, it's a sign that this kid is not so dumb or is always so, so small because he knows the difference between one and the other if he sees me he'll howl like a Michigana and when he sees you he's going to love you so why is that the answer is that the kid knows who his father is because his father is there and his father and his mother is there and, and these are the people that, that, that he feels very comfortable with and he's part of their life. Um, don't, don't ask me one of those loaded lawyer's questions. I know you're a lawyer, but uh, I'm not on the witness stand now. The answer to that is that before he gets married, he should try to experience as much as humanly possible the way families live and don't get involved with the wrong kind of family because you can walk into the wrong kind of family. You know the old story they tell that there was once a, a, a little, a little the couple and, and uh, the guy didn't know how to make a Seder. He was a very, uh, he was an ordinary peasant, you know. So he says to his wife, you know what? He says, listen, Chaiche, go take a look at our neighbor and see how he's making the Seder. So she goes out and she takes a look and she sees that the husband is beating the wife. So she comes back and she doesn't want to tell him. So she says, I just sent you out to see how they make the Seder. Why don't you tell me? She says, I don't want to tell you. I can't tell you. He starts beating her. So she says to him, if you knew, why did you send me? 
You understand? When you hook up, when you hook up with a family, you got to hook up with the right family because you may hook up with the wrong family. You got to know where you're going. But the right way is, if, if I can use a very, very simple term, is basic training. And I must tell you that a lot of the problems that I encounter in the lives of Bali Chuba between the husband and wife is based upon the fact that they really never had the proper opportunity to know exactly how to conduct themselves in a family setup, a husband and wife setup, and in a home setup. So this is a very crucial part of marriage, especially Bali Chuvas. Those who are Bali Chuvas, it, I, I have great empathy for them because they, did, uh, they weren't given the break that I was given. You understand? <clears throat> and were they, were they privileged to be born in a home where the parents ha- gave, uh, lived the way, uh, you know, that the religious parents bring and lived, all the things that I described there before, <clears throat> it would have been a great, wonderful thing. Would have been, but, but that's why their trials and tribulations are far more serious. And that's re- maybe why the Gemara says that where a Baal stands, even the Sadiqim couldn't stand. Because when a Baal comes from left field, where he had nothing of the sort, and the tzaddik was always in that milieu, he was always in that atmosphere, big deal, he, he was a religious guy. So what's the big deal with him? He, did not, he does not have sinned in the first place, even he tried to. But if you come from the left field and you work yourself out, then you break that, that, that chain that had you tied to that way of life. And you come around to a Torah way of life, there's special recognition, and Almighty God understood that too, and he wasn't ashamed to say it in his holy book. But the, the answer specifically to your question is that you should try your best as much as possible to observe and be part of the life of families and see exactly how you're supposed to conduct yourself and how they conduct themselves. And that's the way, these are the things you should set as your priorities and your guidelines and that's the way you start living your life. And another thing is if you don't know, you should never be ashamed to ask. That's a very important, if you do things on your own and you do them wrong, it could only bring you harm instead of good. Sir? I think the, the one thing is, uh, oh. we should look in. Sometimes we think uh, they want a girl who's not a Mabalisha, and uh, whatever level she is. And the point is raised because the situation is there, what the that the is for the children, uh, that uh, the lady would not necessarily prefer a Pacific Mabalisha. Now, one, we deal with that question when it comes up in the The answer to the first part is, in my personal opinion, okay, when two people meet and fall in love with each other, all these side issues fall away. Because if there is a meeting of the minds and there is a happy union between the two, one will give in on one thing, the other one will give in on the other thing, and you'll find a happy formula to be able to live with. That should not be the reason to break or not to do a shiva, in my personal opinion. Number two, there are those young women who will not go out with a Lubavitcher. So you have no problem. They're not going to go out with you in the first place. What do you worry about? You'll never marry them anyway. But if a girl goes out with you and the question comes up and you say, I'm a Lubavitcher, and she says, well, I'm not, and this, that, and the other, there shouldn't be a reason to break a, a, a shidduch. No way. No way. Those things will fall away. And you, you'll find a way, Mishkeferlach. When you're together, you, it, it has a whole different thing than when you're matching records, you know, trying to match points. Forget about it. All that falls away. The second thing about Chanech Lanao Pidake, to educate the child according to his way, the answer to that is very simple. You have to know your child. You have to know your child. You have to know the capacity of your child. You have to know the weak spots of your child. You have to know the qualities of your child. You have to know what uh, exactly where, where he will excel more than in other places. Don't put him to a test where you know before and he's going to fail. In other words... Don't, don't want to outsmart the kid. You want to help him. So you, you don't put him in a setting where he'll become embarrassed. If it's an Ica of, of Torah and Yiddishkeit, then it becomes another story. 
then you can't look at embarrassment. You got to tell the kid, listen, you got you got you got to wash the bread, or you got or you got a bench. And he says, no, I don't want a bench. You got a bench, buddy. You sit down on a bench. You now walk away from the table. Then you go to bench. But there are certain other things where where a child will not fit into to that uh, frame, and it would be wrong to force him, because you're 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 really pushing your luck there. Uh, we were just discussing today about a very very big millionaire. Uh, is a multi-millionaire who has a son. This guy, by the way, is a very religious man, the multi-millionaire, who has a son who is so rebellious, so rebellious, that he wouldn't go into a shul Yom Kippur. We don't even know if he knows what Yom Kippur is anymore. And the person who was discussing this person, uh, this person with me said to me, Rabbi Het, you must know that the way he brought up his kids, that's what he deserves. All right? So it's not so uh, simple. Life is pretty complicated. Yeah. By the way, next. You're next. After him. Here is we have to be smarter than him. Okay, this is this is his. It's not a question. A two-year-old is not really disciplined yet. It's just leading him in, in such a way that he doesn't know that he's being led. You know, either you sit down and read him a story, or you give him a lollipop, or you 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 uh, sit down and sing a song for him. You know, so it, it, children are intrigued by these things. They so fall and, and he doesn't know before he knows he's sleeping. I know a lot of people, this I never did, by the way, in my life. <laughs> I, I, I never did a lot of things a lot of husbands do. But in, 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 uh, there are a lot, a lot of people who lay down with their children to, to, till they fall asleep. I don't know. I, don't, I see, I never had the time for that. Yeah, but you see, wait a minute now. Just take it easy. You see, if it's a question of tired, if you're tired, that's your problem. You've got to be up. Okay? You sleep. If, if you know before, and if that little kid is going to keep you up, then catch a snooze before so that you have the craft to stay up with him. All right? Or ask your wife to stay with him for a while. That, that's the way to do it. But, but you, can't, you can't let him outsmart you, you understand. You're going to fall asleep before him. That's what usually happens. <laughs> That's what happens. Yes, you. I said why. Because because the culture there is so different, and the priorities are different, and the values are different. They're not wild Michigan like we are in America. That's the difference. These are very, very able people. The whole way of life is a different type of life in Africa. The whole street is different. Why it can't be? Ask Mr. Dinkins and Mr. Mandela. Don't ask me. Do you know who Dinkins is? That's your black mayor. And Mandela is the black guy who just came from South Africa. Huh? <laughs> Next. Pardon? Who, me? I didn't. I didn't. Overnight camps. Yeah. Overnight camps. Well, you're talking to a guy who rose and runs overnight camps, so you don't expect me to talk against overnight camps. Overnight camps is a whole different idea. The idea is that you're not sending away your child to get rid of your child. You're sending away your child to give your child something more than the ordinary child could have. You want this kid not to remain in a hot city. You want this kid to be able to go swimming every day. You want this kid to be in the kind of a setting where this kid will learn to share with others, to, to honor the next one's belongings. Don't think that we don't, that we, we don't detect problems with kids in camps. There are kleptomaniacs in camp, kids who go around stealing money from other kids or other belongings. They'll take a toothbrush from a kid. They'll take toothpaste from a kid. There are kids who are destructive. You have all kinds of kids, but you see there, 
this is really a, a laboratory where, where the father and mother can't find out what I find out, do you understand, is a tremendous value to the parent, number one. And number two, by virtue of the fact that the kid is outnumbered by other nice children, even if this kid basically is a rotten kid because this kid wasn't brought up properly, for whatever reason it may be, either because the, the, there wasn't the opportunity at home or because the, the friends that she's with during the year are not good or whatever it is, by virtue of the fact that she's thrown into a bunk with eight other children who are different and keep up with a certain standard and have to show their, their, their abilities when they have the color war and they have all these different challenges <clears throat> and they're singing and they're choral groups and they're dramatic groups and there are some craft groups, it, it, it turns them around because they're still young. It doesn't mean a thing for them to go from one end to the other. I mean, for an adult, it's difficult. But for a child, it doesn't mean a thing, especially if the child is in, in a friendly setting where he won't be pointed out. There, you sissy, you schmissy, you know, the, the way the kids do in the street, you see, which force, force sometimes the child really to do the wrong thing. So that's, that's the answer on overnight camps. I think it's, a, I mean, the Rebbe has spoken out on it too, but I've, 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 I was the first man in Lubavitch uh, before anybody else dreamt of camps, I was the first one to get a consent from this Rebbe to start a, a camp. Inter interestingly enough, the other Rebbe didn't believe in camps. The other Rebbe did not believe in camps. And I understood why, because in those, uh, those years, it wasn't as, as necessary as today. Today, it's, it's a cesspool out here to, to keep a kid in the streets. So it's, it's very, very important that children are sent away and, and, and you know, the, in a setting that, that's very, very uh, uh, inspiring to them and, 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 and encouraging to them. <laughs> Purifying. <laughs> Where here they can become contaminated. In those days, it was different. In those days, the streets weren't so bad and the houses weren't so bad. I mean, it was, it was different. But now, I was the first one to, who had that concept. Three years later, the Ganya Soil started. I was three years ahead of all the camps. But that is a very, very rich approach to life. When you have a kid for four weeks, you'll be surprised. Now, you know, we got this Ivy League college program where we have six weeks. We have college men and women who have no previous background in Judaism. You have to see there the miraculous Horatio Alger stories that come out of that place where in six weeks, six weeks, <clears throat> a young Ivy League student of 25 or 26 or 23 can make a complete turnabout Complete, 360 degrees, and drop the shiksa, and start davening every day, and go to you to to Yerushalayim and sit down and learn in yeshiva for two years, and marry a religious girl, and and whose father, uh, who his own father is nothing but a real goy, jub uh, jubilas, if you know what that means, <laughs> and then nevertheless, this is what happens. So it, we, we we never never measure enough the powers that we have at our our command. If we don't utilize them, if we would only utilize them, and, and if there would be the wherewithal, the money, to be able to fulfill all these many needs and voids that are out there, this whole world would be a lot different. Anybody else? Okay, for, wow, it's late. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen, until the next time you have to suffer from me.